a beautiful day. It turned off kind of cold outside, didn't it? I think we have some that might be missing tonight. We don't have our normal crowd. It seems like there should be more. Well, there's more coming in. How about that? We, we'd like to begin with prayer. There are a couple that we want to mention. Wade Colwell is not doing well at all. Uh, he's in Methodist Hospital. Wade Colwell's in Methodist Hospital and not doing well at all. Uh, so let's remember him in our prayers. Also, uh, Kathy, uh, Glenn. Kathy Glenn, thank you, her mama has fallen and broken her hip. Uh, she is at UT, I believe, at the uh, ER, not the ER, but the uh, intensive care. And uh, they'll say, yeah. She also had a subdural hematoma that they were more concerned about than they were the hip. The brain bleed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Oh, oh, okay. Good. Let's remember her in our prayers. Are there others tonight we want to mention? Okay, let's, let's begin with prayer. Our Father, we thank you for tonight and thank you so much for the beauty and the sunshine and the rain that you've given us, for the spring weather we are having to enjoy, uh, beautiful flowers and every, everything that points toward your creation. We're mindful, Father, of those who we mentioned who are sick. We pray especially for Wade Caldwell and for Kathy Glenn's uh, mother. We also pray, Father, for those who are bereaved and going through uh, difficult times. We ask blessings on our classes, and may we have open minds and open hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we continue with our study. It is on uh, Wayne Jackson's book, The Christian and Mental Health. And this is uh, chapter five. Um, I didn't change that, I mean, should have changed that. But tonight we're on addiction, April 3rd. It may be that we go into next week, I don't know with addiction, but just in case uh, uh, we're on addiction tonight. Um, Brother Jackson wrote this book in uh, 1996, I believe, and uh, we want you to know that as we continue uh, our study on this uh, mental health, it is in no way pointed toward anyone. There's no one in mind that we're trying to, to get this message to, but this is truly a biblical topic, and our, our health, mentally speaking, is something that needs to be uh, a Christian in, in every way. Uh, we looked at several things, uh, but we know that the Gadarene demoniac, as we mentioned and began in Mark chapter 5, after he was cleansed by the Son of God, he had soundness of mind. And that's something every one of us must strive for or want to, is soundness of mind. Um, Satan wants to destroy it. Uh, he, he's a thief, uh, he's a murderer, and he is a liar from the beginning. Uh, he wants to harm our mental health, and in fact, in the United States, we've seen that uh, maybe 26%, roughly one-fourth of the population 18 and older uh, could be diagnosed with a mental uh, problem. Uh, there are many different causes. Uh, could be um, organic, hormonal, chemical, genetic. Could be something uh, degenerative like uh, our liver going bad or something like that. But it is certainly not the case that all mental issues are genetic or organic. Spiritual problems have spiritual solutions. And uh, sometimes we are self uh, our own worst enemy, enemies of mental soundness, uh, self-induced consequences. But there is soundness of mind in being with the Son of God. 
Uh, we talked about this, and just for our study, we all fall within one of these classes. Uh, normal, uh, sometimes we have ups and downs, everybody's like that. Uh, more neurotic, unusual health, uh, behavioral disorders, and then psychotic, so severe health that it requires custodial care. Uh, but for our study, we are just one of these classes, and hopefully we're all up here. Uh, but we want to think about habits, and um, tonight as we do that, I will be uh, taking any comments that you might like to share. Jesus said, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, we think of slave in different terms. Uh, maybe we think in our country of, of what happened this, uh, uh, in this country. But whoever commits sin, everyone is a slave of sin. That word commits is in present tense form. So is there some sin in your life that you continually commit? and thus have become a slave to it. I think you understand the terminology and the idea that we can become a slave. Um, Brother Jackson says, uh, the meaning is every person who keeps on committing sin, who does so in an unrestrained fashion, makes no attempt to curtail his activity, he becomes enslaved to sin. What are some things that we can become enslaved to? Sugar. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to smack you. Up. What else? Work. Work. Indeed. Our phones. Ooh, our phones. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you want to know what it's like to be addicted to something, put your cell phone down, say for six hours, not at night time while you're sleeping during the day, can you do it? <laughs> Some can, they have no problem with that, but there are others of us uh, who might have a difficulty. I found a little uh, thing in my iPhone that will tell you how many times you pick up the phone a day. Just pick it up, not talk, just pick it up. And you may be looking at text or you may be looking online. I'm not going to tell you how many times <laughs> that I picked it up yesterday. Um, but <laughs> I honestly have forgotten, but, it, but it's way, <laughs> but it's in the dozens. Yeah, how about that? It's in the dozens. <laughs> so if you want to know how somebody feels when they're addicted, uh, try setting your phone down and, and don't mess with it all day long. We become so accustomed to that that I think we're slaves to our phone. You ever know anybody who's a slave to fashion? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting away. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and it, this is in the, the context of eating meats, he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful or profitable. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. Be brought under the power of anything. And that includes the phone, it includes sugar, and includes any addiction. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the, the, the point was made that uh, the borrower becomes a slave or a servant to the lender, and that's so true. Good, good point. Anyone else? Any things that we're addicted to? Well, Paul says that we need to bring these things under subjection, brought under the power. And whose power is that? Ours? or the power that lies within us from God. 
through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So anything, regardless of how legitimate, regardless uh, of what it might be, telephone or whatever, anything that intrudes into your mind and begins to control your lifestyle is wrong. And, but there is a balance as a Christian, and um, we must have self-discipline. Um, what is the opposite of self-discipline? Going crazy, what else? <laughs> Impulsivity, yeah. We're, impulses, uh, yeah. So uh, we've got to have self-discipline, self-control. It should be the goal of every Christian to bring everything in subjection and uh, not be brought under the power of anything. So addiction, though, can be overcome. Uh, all of us have good habits. Uh, what is a good habit? Brushing your teeth. That's a good one. Bible study. Uh, some of our so good habits. Um, some of you open up the uh, uh, newspaper to the sports section every time, or you turn on the news when you get home. It's a habit. Uh, those are not necessarily bad. Some of those are good. Some can be bad. What's an example of a bad habit that we might have? Smoking. Anything that does harm to our body? Uh, pardon me? Foul language, oh my, yes. There are some just cannot say 10 words without saying something uh, out of, out of, that's bad. But a habit is a pattern of behavior. And Wayne Jackson says uh, it's a pattern of behavior occasioned by frequent use. By frequent use. Uh, does anybody... Anybody ever had a, a, a word that you wish you hadn't have said and so you substitute for that particular word? Gosh, golly, darn it, dadgummit. Uh-oh, I'm getting impersonal now. <laughs> well, biting your nails, that's not something that's uh, extremely healthy, but it's not sinful. That's kind of indifferent. But Jesus had a good habit. You may remember what Luke chapter 4 talks about when he went into the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, where did he go into? The synagogue. The Bible tells us that was his habit or his, uh, um, uh, what he did. Christians should have the good habit of meeting together. And if we don't meet together, there are some who have the habit of, according to Hebrews 10 and verse 25, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. And there are some in the habit or the manner. Does that make sense? So that, that's maybe they're addicted to not going. I don't know. But, but we go on. We're talking about habits. I'm sorry. Uh, but we, you and I as Christians, uh, should give attention to our habits. Think about them. When I was putting on my shoes to come over, uh, I put on my right shoe first. And my daughter's going to laugh at me at this one. But my grandfather told me when I was about 8 or 10 that it's bad luck to put your left shoe on first. <laughs> so, I, so I put my right shoe on first. Even 60 years later... 50 or whatever, that's a habit, there's nothing wrong with it, but we need to give attention to our habits. It's possible for habits to become compulsive, and compulsive behavior here is when one's pattern of conduct has become so strong that he feels virtually swept away by his inclination to do certain things. His appetites control him. That, that's a quote from Wayne Jackson. I think compulsive behavior, and if you want to break it down, it's that last little portion of what it says there. His appetites control him. 
Have you ever known someone whose appetites control them? Well, you think about food. Can that appetite for food control us? Yeah, it, it, it can. Um, we see all kinds of things on the, uh, on the television to try to get us to conquer that habit. I was listening today to a little article about Ozempic, and uh, so many people are taking that now, and it's working for about, oh, maybe seven out of ten, and the others doesn't do a thing. Uh, but then if you don't control it, it certainly can become uh, a problem, but it is controlling you. We're talking about habits becoming compulsive, and again and again, uh, the person is plunged into doing these things. That They do them, and each time they do them, they feel acute guilt. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to break this. I'm not going to do this habit, this bad habit. I'm not going to do it. And then lo and behold, things get out of hand or whatever, and we think, oh, it's not going to have, not going to hurt just one more time. And we start to convince ourselves that, this habit is okay, so watch your habits. Um, the person who is compulsive, I think, is a miserable person because they do this, they torment themselves by this conduct that they don't want to do, but they do it over and over again, and it can torment you. It really can work on your mind. Any thoughts about that? No? He calls out to God. Can I please have help? Is there any help for me, God? Surely you have put something in your word, a principle, an activity, or something that we are to learn that will help us break our habits or addictions. There are various forms of addiction, and uh, uh, they're also compulsive actions, if you want to call them that, but they're varied, and they also have varied levels of intensity. So let's talk about number one, drug addiction, if we may. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm sorry, I don't have it on the board, so you'll have to look it up. 1 Corinthians 6, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. Paul's speaking here. And the context is about, um, well, let's just, just read it. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor homosexuals. Some call that catamites, uh, those who submit to homosexuals. Nor sodomites, nor uh, thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. None of these are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. You were washed, you were sanctified or set apart, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, he covers a lot of things in there, but let's talk about a few more. Works of the flesh. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and begin with verse 19. Very familiar, Galatians 5, 19 and following. Paul said, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Where in the Bible does it talk about us with drug addiction? Well, 
the closest you might find is the word for sorcerers. And uh, sorcerers have, uh, it's, it has something to do with pharmacy, pharma, phar, forget the word, but anyway, <laughs> maybe Clint knows it. But nevertheless, <clears throat> these things are, are uh, not good for us. What about Jesus? Remember when he went to the cross? And they held up to him something that he would not take. What was it? Vinegar mixed with gall or something of that nature. It was a combination of some kind of pain reliever. And he refused to take it. Now, I don't, this is personal. I don't think he refused to take it because he might have thought it was wrong. I think per, he wanted to have his true mind and know exactly what he was doing during this crucifixion. And he didn't want any kind of drug substance to alter that. Any, any thoughts about that? No? Oh, that's good. And abstain from every form of evil. I've been drug addicted. i just tell you right now, I, uh, I fell down and I broke my arm and uh, it hurt. And I had to take them for a while. And I got strung out on these uh, oxy whatever they are. And uh, they, they do things to you. It makes you... Makes you not yourself. Let me put it that way. Makes you not yourself. I have the utmost compassion for someone who may be addicted to drugs. Now today we have drugs that, uh, fit, uh, what do you call that, fentanyl? Uh, that's a very, very big thing. Uh, I don't know, but I would imagine you could buy fentanyl in Clinton, Tennessee if you really wanted it. You could find somebody that would sell it to you. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, drug addiction is a problem. Number two, prescription addiction. Uh, many people use prescription drugs. I take six every day, seven, six or seven. Uh, I take something for my statin, for blood pressure, for this, that, and the other. And uh, if I don't take them every day, well, you know, I might get sick or whatever. But the thing about it is, uh, we can get addicted to prescription drugs. Like I was telling you, I, I got addicted to the prescription drugs. And some are using it as a shortcut. I, I can't tell you all the reasons I used it. But I, my body said, you need to have this chemical in your body or else you're not going to feel good. Well, how did I get over it? cold turkey and the help of God. It took a while, a, a week at least, till your body is going to get that out of your system. And um, prescription addiction uh, sometimes may be needed to bring a body into chemical balance. Uh, you've heard that phrase. Uh, there's some chemical unbalance, imbalance. And so whoever the doctor is, psychologist or your MD, whoever it is, they might prescribe something for a chemical imbalance. That's not wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And here's why. If you cut your finger, what do you do? Well, you clean it and you put a Band-Aid on it. And you help it to heal. You might even put some medicine on it underneath the Band-Aid so it'll heal quicker. Because you have cut your body, physically, you have hurt your body. Your body may be hurting some chemical imbalance. Doctors can tell those kinds of things with blood tests and all kinds of uh, surveys and that kind of thing. But, it, but I very strongly say I don't think that, that those things are wrong. Anybody got any comments or thoughts about that? Yes, sir.
It's out of balance. It's out of balance. And when you just keep that medication, one that you take it all, then it's the thing where it goes back to the old, you know, but it's the old way of not giving out enough of that medication. Mm. And that, that chemical in your brain to, to keep you on an even keel. That's the reason why sometimes you have people that, especially with bipolar, I see uh, that will go off of bipolar medicine and go to marijuana because marijuana is a it flatlines the behavior it flatlines your uh, ups and downs that you're having and, uh, and so it works exactly the same way if you can get on the right medication then it will do the same thing yes they try to self medicate basically yeah uh, not a good idea to self-medicate. I got high blood pressure. Uh, should I self-medicate that? Well, I could lose a little bit of weight, I'm sure. But drug addiction, prescription addiction, some, some use uh, prescription drugs to ease their pain. I mean, it's a big deal. If you've known, you, you may be in the audience and you deal every day with pain and you just don't say anything about it, but you're really in pain. Every time we assemble, we come together, or maybe throughout the day, you're in pain. And, and you know what? There may be a time when you need something to help with pain. It's one of the most innocent of the addictions, addictive to pain, because uh, people get to the point where they get, you know, they depend on the painkiller uh, instead of going through and trying to live through the pain and get things where your your body your body gets the pain. Mm. comes to my mind, do you remember Genesis chapter two when God created Eve? He took a rib from Adam's side, but before he did that, what did he do with Adam? A deep sleep. <laughs> the very first surgery, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Well, why did God put him in a deep sleep? It would be very scary to see a rib coming out of your body, and it probably wouldn't feel very good. <laughs> yes, you could go say that again. In the garden before he fell, um, God could have done that, I think, at that time. Obsessive spending is an addiction. Obsessive or obsessive spending. Why? Now, that's, that's not something that tempts me, really, but ha. Okay. Retail therapy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't watch Tammy Faye, but she was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she would just. I dated a girl in high school, and her aunt that lived, uh, she was a uh, neighbor married, and um, she just would spend her money on, she sees something on TV, she wants it, she'll get it. Her house had boxes of things that had never been opened because she had bought those things. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that innocently, but, but it, she was addicted to it. Easy credit is a, is a contributing factor for that. In the lockdown with COVID, when you stayed in the house, <laughs> did anybody shop? Yeah, shopped online. 
We do that all day long. Some of us have our uh, business in that. But it can really uh, be obsessive, and it can be an addiction. Gambling. Gambling can be an addiction. One day I was sitting in my office, and a uh, brother in Christ came. He said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He says, um, I, I've got a problem with gambling. He said, I, I bet on this with just a few guys, but I bet on it, and uh, sometimes I've won. But most of the time I've lost. And it was affecting him as a Christian, as a father, as a husband, gambling. Yes, sir. Mm. Drink responsibly or gamble responsibly. And then they're probably at the bottom, they'll put a, a gambling hotline. Yeah, the, yeah, if you have help, please call this. If you have uh, an addiction, you need help, call this number. Um, I never in my wildest dreams thought that in my lifetime we would see legalized gambling for sports all throughout the United States. And you see commercials on television, don't you? You hear them on radio, and they, they, I don't know the, the cost, but I know there are going to be a lot that are addicted to gambling. Yes? Are we talking about the lottery, too? No, yeah, the lottery, too. Yeah. All that money is being sunk in it, and nobody's ever winning. It. And so you think with that many people playing, somebody's accidentally hit it. You know? So somebody's, somebody's profiteering off of all the games. It's pretty uh, the Tennessee Education Lottery. Uh, they'll have it tonight. You can look on your 10 o'clock news and, or 11 o'clock, and it'll give you the numbers they've drawn. Yes, sir. A, oh, her, her salary is over 800 Yeah. For the I, I, would, uh, I, I would not do it. I, I'd be very careful condemning someone that did it, but I wouldn't do it. You want to waste your money? Just go on the lottery. Chances of winning are so infinitesimal or just whatever. <laughs> You're not going to win. When I was uh, growing up, I remember uh, they had a little fair in town every year in May. They called it May Day. And they had, at the local park, they would have booths and this, that, and the other. And they had a bingo tent. So I told my mom, Mom, can I have a couple dollars? I'm going to go play bingo. <laughs> no, son, <laughs> you may not. So I felt bad every time I win in bingo, but no, I don't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But gambling is, is a problem with addiction. All right, here's one that's it's really big, and that is pornography or sexual lust. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. 1 and 2. Paul said, it is good, this is 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Um, do you know what? In the time that this was written in Corinth, that they would go and they would go to the temple of Diana. And if you were a man, you would go into this temple and you would have sex with one of the 
prostitute, temple prostitutes, and that was, quote, a form of worship. But Paul says, no, <laughs> you don't want to do that. Let, let it be married in married. The marriage bed is honorable uh, unto all, the Hebrew writer tells us. Uh, they're progressive sexual sins. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14, there's a little passage that Peter talks about uh, false, false teachers, but he says they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having eyes full of adultery. You look at a, a woman, what did Jesus say about looking at a woman to lust after her? Yeah. You've already committed adultery in your heart. Take your eye out, poke your hand, cut your hand off. It's better to go into to life uh, blind or maimed. Look at Romans chapter 1, please. And beginning at verse number 18, Paul says these things. This is uh, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. It's evident, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, they're clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man or perishable man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature, Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased or a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, verse 29, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. A, a lot of things mentioned in that, but that last little statement in verse number 32, but also approve of those things who practice them. If you're looking at pornography... Is it wrong or would it be wrong to say you are approving of those things? Anybody? What if it's a habit? Can it be a habit? It can be an addiction. Uh, pornography is a huge problem in the world, not just the United States. 
I didn't look up statistics. Uh, they change. Uh, they just get bigger and better and worse every time I look at them. But there are ways to overcome a sexual addiction. There are ways to overcome lust. There are ways to overcome pornography. Um, and one of them is to be married. But you say, well, that doesn't do any good. Well, if you're married and you're addicted to pornography, that never happens, does it? Oh, yeah. Sure it does. Sexual sins are progressive. There was an interview uh, in about 1990, I believe, when Ted Bundy was put to death. You remember the murderer. Uh, he killed many people. He was interviewed the night before he was put to death. He, he was put to death. That was his uh, sentence. And there was an interview before by Dr. James Dobson the night before. And it, it's online. You could probably go to YouTube and, and find it. I haven't looked at it in years. But I do know this. He asks Ted Bundy, how did you get started in the life that you've lived? And he said, pornography. Pornography. Now, if that was in 1990 and he was an older guy, he was looking at some old pornography. Today, we see it all over the Internet. You have to have, or I do, as well as everybody else, have blockers that block ads and block pornography. And if you have Google, it will automatically get rid of some of that stuff. But it's a problem. It's an addiction. Any thoughts about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another thing, you're not, you're looking at it, me and all the men and all that. People forget that a lot of those images you're seeing those people are victims of the sex trade and they don't have a choice and they're being, they're being abused. Yes. Their lives are being controlled and ruined because of what they're being forced to do. Yes. And You are contributing to their abuse because there are many who are trafficked, who are victims. It, it's, it tears my heart out whenever I see um, uh, one of those Amber Alerts go off. They'll say somebody's been taken. Uh, and you never know if it's by another parent or somebody that's, oh, man. Breaking addiction now. We've got about one minute. Let me give you four things to think about. And I didn't put them up there. <laughs> Number one, confess the wrong. Confess the wrong. Uh, if you hide it and you keep it hidden, it's not good. Number two, Pray that you not enter into temptation. Isn't that what Jesus said? Pray that you not enter into temptation. And then in verse 20, look at Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44. I don't want to miss this. It's a good point. Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44. Jesus is speaking. Or he's in the garden, rather. And verse 44, an angel appeared to him from heaven, verse 33, strengthening him. And he, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Wayne Jackson says that there is a more intense level of prayer than normal. What is that intense he prayed more earnestly. What does that mean? <coughs> prayed more earnestly. Well, one time they said sweat drops of blood because it became physical. It did become because being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. Yes. Yes. 
confess the wrong, prayer, avoid circumstances and some people that might help you be doing your addiction. And number four, associate with spiritual people. Uh, spending much time in scripture. There are so many things that we could say, but we're out of time. And I thank you for your kind attention and comments. using a songbook this evening and you'd like to mark our invitation song, it'll be number 23. 23, we'll sing this song after Richard's devotional thought tonight. And then before, we'll sing number 755. 755. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saint of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, like to turn to Philippians, I'd like to read a passage in there in chapter 2, uh, two or three verses. I read an article about the day that Robert, Lee, Robert E. Lee uh, surrendered to uh, General Grant at Appomattox. Anybody ever been to Appomattox? It's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, um, on the day that he did that, 
uh, Robert E. Lee, um, he was going to go in full uniform, dress uniform, and, and appear uh, to General Jackson and hopefully get good terms. But in order to start that off, what he did was send uh, an officer, one of his staff officers, to talk to General Grant and his subordinates. And you got to remember still, the war is going on, and you're either blue or you're gray. And he wanted to talk. And so what he did was to take a white dish towel, about yay big, and hold it over his arms, this staff officer, and went in to President Grant and his officers. That was a sign of peace. I'm not going to start anything. I want to talk. Well, not everybody appreciated it <laughs> because when he gave that white dish rag, one of those who he talked to, he was uh, bowing down to, so to speak, or not bowing down, I guess you would say surrendering. He wanted to keep that white dish towel as a souvenir. <laughs> and the man said, not on your life will I let you have this dish towel. There's no way. I want anybody in knowing in this world, knowing what we had to do. You see, armies don't normally carry a white flag of surrender. That would be worse. Oh, get out the white flag. No, they try to find something that's white, and that's what they did. The point is this. This individual did not want anyone to have this white dish rag because he didn't want them to be reminded of the evil that was going on. We're all going to answer one day to God. We're all going to confess our belief in God. The Bible says, therefore, and this is Philippians 2 and verse 9, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. One day you will confess whether you want to or not. Why don't you do it? Why don't you admit that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He died for your sins. And you can have forgiveness of your sins through his sacrifice. Is there one here tonight that needs to obey the gospel by being baptized? Is there one who might could use prayers on something going on in their life? We, we, we're family here. We want to help one another, pray for one another. And if we can do that, let us know as we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing. Leave every care and worldly strife.
Thank you for being here tonight. We want to close by making a few announcements. And I know that Richard probably went over some of this in class, but uh, in adult class, but for those of you that were in Bible class, we want to remember the following on our prayer list. Megan Nicholson, of course, uh, is deployed and, uh, in Kuwait, headed to Jordan, I think, so please remember her in your prayers. Derek, still not able to be out, so remember Derek Payne, if you would. Bobby Price, who is Kathy Glenn's mother, fell yesterday morning early, and they took her to the hospital in uh, Tazewell, and she was flown by Lifestar to UT and admitted to the uh, ER ICU unit, and she's been there for two days, and everything kind of went well and stabilized today. If she has a good night tonight, they will be moving her to the surgery floor because she did, ble uh, she did break her hip, and she had a, a, a brain bleed, and that was more severe yesterday than the hip was. So. Either way, she will be there, and, and even after she has the hip replaced, she will probably have to have rehab. So please remember that family in your prayers. Also, Wade Colwell, room 346, Methodist Medical Center. Uh, you know, he's been on our prayer list for months and months, and uh, he is, uh, he's a pretty sick fella. So if you'd like to go see him, he's in room 346. But please remember not only him, but also Carolyn and Karen and Jody. Karen and Jody both still sick, not able to be out much, and so they've asked for your prayers, and they've asked for your prayers for Wade. And then Carolyn and Heather, too, uh, remember, and uh, I think they have two boys. One of them is uh, Dale, and I forget the other one's name, but Darren, remember, remember all of them in your prayers, if you would. Bobby Sue remains at NHC. She's not happy, but she is rehabbing. Connie said uh, that she doesn't like it. She's ready to go home. But hopefully she will be able to get uh, some strength and be able to come out. Are there any, anybody else that needs to be on the prayer list that I do not know about? I will refer you to the bulletin, too, for the long prayer list. Uh, and events in the, in the congregation, Silver Saints, Sunday evening at 4.30. Uh, we'll fold the bulletin if we get a copy of uh, Gary's newsletter. He's in a bad place and may or may not get it to us, so we'll make that announcement again Sunday morning. And uh, we are happy to announce that Julie Priest, who has been part of our congregation for a long time, has decided to place membership. Julie, we welcome you to the Clinton family. We're excited to have you, and we thank you very much for you wanting to be part of our congregation. The ladies going to Johnson City, 6 p.m. Friday night meeting here. If you have any questions, call Gail, and I think there's somebody else that's going to be driving too. So uh, if you want to call and ask Gail who else that is, I'm sure she would tell you what, what the specifics on that is. Anything else that we need to announce that I'm not aware of? Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for the blessings of being able to be here. We're mindful, Father, of these that we have mentioned tonight that are on our prayer list, and we ask that you would bless the doctors that care for them, that you would uh, give them better health, that they might be able to go back to their normal walks of life. Father, we ask for uh, your care over the family while they are sick. We're mindful, Father, of those that were uh, in the storm last night. We're thankful that you protected and that we don't know of death yet, but we pray, Father, that you would be with them as they clean up and try to regain their lives back. Father, we thank you for this congregation. We thank you for each member. Uh, we thank you, Father, for those that are new members, and we're thankful for Julie and her family. Pray that you would bless them, Father. Help us to be the example we need to be. We know that others may see 
you through us, and they may not ever see anything else. So help us to be the examples we need to be. Pray that you'd go with us as we leave. Uh, protect us to the home. Use us in service tomorrow. Help us to be more like Jesus, Father, every day that we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.